ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله من بعد today ان شاء الله we'll explain page 313 surah taha chapter 20 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in reference to Musa alayhi salam In istafaituka ala nasi bin salati wa bi kalami I have chosen you above my messages above men I have chosen you above men by two things my messages I gave you my message you became a messenger I buy and by my speaking to you. So here clearly Allah says that he spoke to Musa alayhi salam. So anyone that says that Allah does not speak, he has to try to prove uh, what this means. This means over all human beings of that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Musa alayhi salam because also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he preferred the children of Israel over al alamin over mankind it's mankind at their time because he gave them uh, the the message through their prophets and he legislated jihad for them and he chose them over mankind at their time but of course after that after the transgressions after the disbelief after changing allah's laws killing prophets allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed them and made their hearts uh, hard as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the quran so this means that Musa alayhi salam was made better than all other human beings at that time because of course Muhammad alayhi salam is the best of all human beings by none and then comes after him Ibrahim alayhi salam according to the scholars uh, this means over all human beings at that time it has also been said that Allah said oh Musa do you know why I chose to speak to you directly out of all the people, Musa said no. Allah then says, because I have not made anyone humble himself as much as you have humbled yourself to me. So he, Musa alayhi salam, was humble before his Lord. And that's why Allah does not like arrogant people and does not guide arrogant people. As, but as far as the humble people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually guides them to the truth. Concerning Allah's statement, so listen to that which will be revealed. Now, listen to what I say to you and what I reveal to you. Verily, I am Allah. There is no God but me. This is the first obligation upon all responsible people of age, and that is to know that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to worship Allah alone without partners. Concerning Allah's statement to Musa alayhi salam, fa'abudani, so worship me, this means single me out alone for worship and establish my worship without associating anything with me. Waqim is salat ali dhikri and perform salat for my, for my remembrance. It has been said that this means pray in order to remember me. It has also been said that it means and establish the prayer whenever you remember me. Establish the prayer whenever you remember me. There is a supporting evidence for this second statement in a hadith recorded by Imam Ahmad from Anas who said that the Messenger of Allah said إِذَا رَقَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ عَنِ الصَّلَاحِ أَوْ غَفَلَ عَنْهَا فَلْيُصَلِّهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا فَلْيُصَلِّهَا إِذَا Whenever one of you sleeps past the prayer or he forgets to pray, then let him pray when he remembers it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and perform salah for my remembrance. In the two Sahih, Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it is reported from Anas bin Malik radiallahu an, that the image of Allah وسلم, said, Man nama an salatin aw nasiha. Whomever slept past the prayer time or forgot it, then his 
expiation is that expiation 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 uh, is that he prays it when he remembers it there is no expiation for it other than that there is no expiation for it other than that expiation expiation okay it's expiation Concerning Allah's statement in the Sa'ata verily the hour is coming. This means that it is established and there is no void in it. It will be and it is inevitable. Concerning Allah's statement, I am almost hiding it. At the Haq we learned from Ibn Abbas that he used to recite it as I almost kept it hidden from myself. Ibn Abbas then would say, because nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid the knowledge about the hour so much that he almost hid it from himself. But of course, nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can also mean that I almost hid that it even going to happen. This is also a possible explanation Allah knows best. I am almost hiding. This means that no one knows it's a point in time except me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah also said, Heavy is its burden through the heavens and the earth. It shall not come upon you except all of a sudden. That's the last day, the hour. This means that its knowledge, the knowledge that it, the, the last hour will come and that everyone will stand before the mighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for judgment. This news weighs heavily upon the dwellers of the heavens and the earth because course if the heavens are the dwellers the the dwellers of the heavens are the angels and of course they knew Allah and they they fear him much that's why they worry even though there is no reckoning for them and also the dwellers of earth are the pious people basically Allah subhanahu wa make us among them because they know that on the day of judgment uh, there's going to be much terror and much reckoning and every single Bad deed that we did and we forgot about it. If Allah didn't forget it, it will come out in front of us and we'll have to pay for it. We seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Concerning Allah's statement, So that every person will be rewarded for that which he strives. I will, that means Allah subhanahu wa says that he will establish the hour and it is inevitable. And Allah will certainly reward every person who does something according to what he did. As Allah says, so whoever does uh, any good deed equal to the weight of an atom shall see it. And whosoever does evil equal to the weight of an, of an atom shall see it. You're only being requited for what you used to do. In other words, if you did good, you will find good. If you did otherwise, blame yourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَا يَصُدَّنَّكَ عَنْهَا مَنْ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِهَا Therefore, do not let the one who does not believe that the last hour is going to happen, do not let that kind of person divert you from the truth and from believing that it's actually happening because... As the Prophet said, A person is on the religion of his best friend, so that each and every one of you examine who his best friend is. How many people were pious, and because of the evil companionship, they, they went astray and committed evil acts that were unimaginable. The address here is direct towards all individuals who are responsible and capable of taking heed to this message. This means, do not follow the way of the person who does not believe in the last day, in the day of judgment. And he only pursues his desires in this worldly life. So basically for the youth, uh, Muslim youth that lives in the Kafir land, they have to heed this warning. You know, for them, they, they take lightly the fact that their best friend is a Kafir. Your best friend should not be a Kafir. Your friend should not be a Kafir. You should deal with a Kafir on a need basis, but to befriend him, this is uh, something that's against Islam. It's against the principle of wala and bara. Uh, it's against the principle of uh, friendship and uh, animosity. Uh, 
because the disbelievers should only feel animosity from us until they believe, as Ibrahim السلام, did to his father and his people who were disbelievers. They told them, Innani bara'um mimma ta'budun. And also said, Qad badat il ba Qad badat bayna wa baynakum ul adawat wal ba'da'u abadan hatta tu'minu billahi wahdah. Surely there is going to be enmity and hatred between us until you believe in Allah alone, until you stop worshiping others besides Allah. And that's how a Muslim should do. Because uh, many people think that if you're born and your parents say that they are Muslims and you have a Muslim name, you're a Muslim. No. Uh, there are many things that a person can do in his life that can negate his Islam and that would cause him to exit Islam. Uh, scholars such as Muhammad al Wahab uh, mentioned the 10 most popular ones. And among them is for the person to believe that a disbeliever is not a disbeliever. Because some uh, ignorant Muslims, they say, well, the, the Christians, they are not disbelievers. They worship Allah in their own way. No, they don't worship Allah. They worship Isa, alayhi salam. They worship shaitan. Anyone that worships anyone besides Allah worships shaitan. And if you say this, you have negated your Islam. You have exited Islam. You know, this is not something that's easy. Also, if a person says that, you know, the Constitution, human rights, uh, equality is better than the backwards laws of Islam, this person has exited Islam. With the consensus of scholars, there's no different opinion about it. If a person says that the Western ways are better than the Sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, this person has exited Islam. These are nawaqid Islam. They are, they are uh, annihilations of your Islam. It's like, uh, let's say, for example, you uh, let's say you build a building, right? You have to put a foundation and build the building. If you come and take over the foundation, what's going to happen to the building? It's going to crumble. So the foundation is these things that we have to keep, like making sure that we know that a disbeliever is a disbeliever, that the way of Prophet Salam is the best way, the law of Muhammad Salam. Of course, when we say Muhammad is revealed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the best law out there, is better than any uh, hypocritical constitution. Uh, that the ways, the way of life legislated to us by Allah is better than any Western sanctioned uh, ways uh, where they say equality between man and woman and all that nonsense. And if only they applied it in, the, in their countries, it would be bad. But, you know, it's, it's big uh, slogans. But when it comes to practice, it doesn't happen. So these things a person has to know about it. And Back to our point, you know, befriending disbelievers. This is dangerous for a person's faith. It may actually cause them to exit Islam without him knowing. Also mocking the religion or any tenets of the religion, like mocking the beard, mocking the, uh, the sheep of the Eid, you know, sometimes we see in WhatsApp those things circulating, mocking Ramadan, mock, like making jokes about Ramadan and people fasting. All these things can actually take a person outside the fold of Islam, yes. You know, joking about a tenet of Islam makes a person leave Islam, and the proof is in the Quran and the Sunnah. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "La ta'tadiru qad kafartum ba'da imanikum." Do not seek excuses that you were just playing. You surely have disbelieved after having believed. So whoever behaves like these people, then verily has failed and lost. Fatarda. So Allah tells Musa alayhi salam, "Don't believe those that deny." The resurrection, because if you do believe them, then you are going to perish. Again, as we said, tarda with a dal means you perish. Tarda with a dad that means you are pleased. So two different meanings. And in recitation, we have to be careful not to read it for tarda. It's actually for tarda, for tarda, for tarda, da, da, not da, not for tarda, for tarda, lest you perish. This means that you will be destroyed and ruined if you disbelieve in the last hour in the resurrection. And what will his wealth, this disbeliever, avail him when he goes down in destruction? Okay, so taradda, taradda. So Ibn Kathir brought this verse to explain the, the meaning of taradda. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَىٰ قَالَ هِيَا صَايَ أَتَوَكَّعُ عَلَيْهَا وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَىٰ غَنَمِي وَلِيَ فِيهَا مَآنِبُ أُخْرَىٰ قَالَ أَلْقِهَا يَا مُوسَىٰ فَأَلْقَاهَا فَإِذَا هِيَ حَيَّةٌ تَسْعَىٰ 
قال خذها ولا تخف سنعيدها سيرتها الأولى Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues the discussion with Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam left his, left his family and went to the source of light that he saw because he was lost and they were called. And instead of finding people there with a fire as he thought, he uh, found out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking to him through a tree. Again, some people say it's not Allah that was speaking, it's, it's the tree that was speaking, Allah made it speak. No, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was speaking because Allah says, Bikalami, and also says, Kallamahu Rabbuhu. Uh, also, there were other verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he spoke to Musa alayhi salam. So, yeah, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Musa alayhi salam, and what is in your right hand, though, Musa? Of course, Musa alayhi salam knew, knows what's in his right hand, and so does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, this is my stick whereon I lean and wherewith I beat down branches for my sheep and wherein I find other uses. Allah said, cast it down, O Musa. That means throw it. He cast it down. Musa said, I cast it down. And behold, it was a huge snake moving quickly. Allah said, grasp it and fear not. You shall return to its former state. The stick of Musa salam, turned into a snake. This was a proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Musa salam, and a great miracle. This was something that broke through the boundaries of what is considered normal. Thus, it was a brilliant evidence that none but Allah could do. It was also a proof that no one could come with the likes of this from mankind except the Prophet who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means a magician cannot do these things. It's something much beyond the capability of man and jinn kind. It is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The story of Allah's statement, وَمَا أَتِنْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى And what is in your right hand, O Musa? Some of the scholars of Tafsir have said, He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only said this to him in order to draw his attention to it. It has also been said, He only said this to him in order to affirm for him what was in his hand. In other words, that which is in your right hand is a stick that you are familiar with. You will see what we are about to do with it now. What is in your right hand of Musa? This is an interrogative phrase for the purpose of affirmation. In other words, Allah SWT knows what's in Musa's hands, and Musa SWT knows what's in his hand. But Allah SWT is asking him so that Musa SWT can testify with his mouth that this is just a stick, a normal stick. And then Allah SWT is going to turn it into a huge python snake. So Musa alayhi salam is going to know that this is actually his stick that turned into a python. So it's an affirmation of what is in his hands. So Musa alayhi salam clearly said, قَالَ يَا صَيَا He said, this is my stick where I lean up, I lean on it while I was walking. And where would I beat down branches for my sheep? This means I use it, I use it to shake the branches of trees so that the leaves will fall for my sheep to eat from them. Abdul Rahman bin al-Qasim reported from Imam Malik that he said, it is when a man places his staff, his stick, into a branch and shakes the stick so that the leaves of the branch and the fruits will fall without having to break uh, uh, the stick or breaking the branch. That is not the same as striking or beating the branch because you can, uh, number one, uh, break the branch and also not only the, the leaves and fruits are going to fall down, also some small branches or sticks that may bother or scare the sheep. So this Ahushu uh, had this method is most perfect for achieving what is necessary without causing any harm, breaking down the leaves and the fruits, that is, without breaking any parts of the tree. Maharan also said the same. Concerning his statement, and wherein, that means in my staff and my stick i found other uses this means other benefits services and needs beside this some of the scholars took upon themselves and the burden of mentioning of these obscure uses but it's not necessary i mean we know what sticks are for concerning allah's statement allah said cast it down on musa throw down this stick that is in your hand that is in your right hand on musa he cast it down and behold it was a snake moving quickly. 
This means that the stick changed into a huge snake, like a long python, and it moved with rapid movements. It moved as if it were the fastest type of small snake, yet it was in the form of the largest snake, while still having the fastest of movements. So it was huge, but it was able to move as fast as a small snake. Tas'a was moving quickly, so his stick turned into a huge long python that was very fast in his movements. So of course, when you see a huge snake moving quickly towards you, it's normally to be scared, and that's why Fir'aun, the Alakursa, was scared later on when he saw that. And he got up on his throne, uh, seeking refuge from the huge snake that was coming at him. Concerning Allah's statement, We shall return the stick to its former state. Former state. The form that it is in, as you recognized it before. and press your right hand to your left side it will come forth white and shining without any disease or not as another sign so that we may show you some of our greatest signs go to Fir'aun verily he has transgressed he said Musa said oh my lord open for me my chest and ease my task for me and loosen the knot from my tongue, that they understand my speech, and appoint for me a helper from my family, Harun, my brother. Increase my strength with him, and let him share my task, that we may glorify you much, and remember you much. Verily, you are ever seeing us. The hand of Musa turned in white without any disease. This is the second sign of Musa, alayhi salam, that is Allah has commanded him to place his hand into the opening, the top opening of his garment by the neck, as is clearly stated in another ayah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَدْخِلْ يَدَكَ فِي جَيْبِكَ Make your hand enter your jayb. Your jayb is not the pocket. The jayb is actually the upper opening of the garment. And this is uh, why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told Jibir alayhi salam blew into the jayb of Maryam. That means the, the, the top opening of her clothes it, like blew into it and then she became pregnant with Isa alayhi salam. It is mentioned here merely as a passive reference. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And press your hand to your side. That means uh, it's understood that Musa a.s. would need to uh, put his hand in the top opening of his garment before entering it and uh, putting it to uh, next to his armpit. Basically, just below his armpit. That's basically janah, uh, that's the side. Commanded uh, his hand to open his garment. I think it's, it's mentioned here after that. Allah said in another ayah, and draw your hand close to your side to be free from fear. In other words, when you feel fear, make your uh, hand under hand or hands. She says, Yeah, that one hand. Put your hand uh, almost uh, under your armpit so that you will feel secure from, from fear. Mujahid, Mujahid said, Mumia Press your hand to your side. This means put your palm under your upper arm. So the upper arm, you put your hand under it, so almost by the armpit. When Musa put his hand into the opening of his garment and brought it out, it came out shining as if it were half moon, as if it were a light bulb, like with today's, with today's uh, terms. Concerning his statement, it will come forth white without any disease. This means without any leprosy. 
In other words, it's not that he's, it's going to become white like a person that has leprosy, ailment, or disfigurement. This was stated by Ibn Abbas, Mujahid Ikrim, Qatada, the Hakasud, and others. Al Hassan Basri said he brought it out, and by Allah, it was as if it were a lamp, as you say, a light bulb, a lamp, a shiny lamp. So it was a miracle that you know a human hand would actually shine and emit light just like a lamp would do. From this, Musa Alistair knew that he had surely met his Lord, the mighty and sublime, because it's not some, something that magicians can, magicians can do, or the jinn or mankind. This is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "You know, you come in ayatin al kubara that we may show you some of our greatest signs." Allah commanded Musa to go to Fir'aun to convey the message. إِذَهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَهَا Go to Fir'aun, verily he has transgressed. This means, go to Fir'aun, the king of Egypt, whom you left. Whom you left Egypt, fleeing from. Because when Musa السلام, wanted to defend uh, the person from the children of Israel, and he punched the person, he killed him. So he... he left Egypt, running away from Fir'aun and Yusuf because they were going to kill him because in the law, if you kill, you are to be killed. So Allah is telling Musa salam, go back to Fir'aun, the person that you left Egypt fleeing from, and invite him to the worship of Allah alone, who has no partners. Command Fir'aun to treat the children of Israel well and to not torment them, for verily he has transgressed, oppressed, preferred the worldly life, and forgotten the Most High. The Most High, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true Lord. Supplication of Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam made a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَأَهْلُ لُقْدَةً مِّن لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي Musa alayhi salam said, Oh my Lord, open for me my chest and ease my task for me. Musa requested his Lord to expand his chest for his mission. Because verily he was commanding him with a great task and a weighty affair. So give him more patience, give him more support, give him, uh, not make him steadfast, not make him be afraid. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salam to the mightiest king on earth at that time. He was the only king, the only emperor, he ruled the world. He was the most arrogant and severe of all people in his disbelief. And he had the largest army and the most powerful kingdom. He was the most tyrannical and the most obstinate of rulers. His case, his case was such that he claimed not to know Allah at all. And that he knew of no God for his subjects other than himself. Because no one could challenge him on this earth. So he thought that he is God. That his subjects would need to worship him, as he said, I do not know any God for you except me. And along with this, Musa السلام, lived in the home of Fir'aun for a period of time as a child, as we know the story. He stayed in Fir'aun's own room and slept on his bed. Then after this, he killed one of their people and feared that they would retaliate by killing him in return. Thus, he, Musa السلام, fled from the Egyptians and remained an outlaw during this entire time. Then after all of this, his Lord sent him to them as a warner, calling them to worship Allah alone with their associated partners with him. This is why he, Musa السلام, said, Rabbi shalah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Because when Musa السلام, left Egypt, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us in Surah Al-Qasas, قال, فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفَيْ يَتَرَقَّبْ so he left Egypt in a state of fear, watching, looking around, making sure that they're not coming for him. So here he's going back to the same people. He left Egypt being afraid from them. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him steadfast and to not fear them. Oh my Lord, open for me my chest and ease my task for me. This means I cannot perform this task if you do not help me. Aid me and support me. And loosen the knot from my tongue. Loosen the knot from my tongue that they understand my speech. What's the tongue? What's the knot that, that's, referred, that's being referred to here? Here is the lisp that Musa alayhi salam had. When he spoke, uh, he had lisp. Why? Because it was a result of an incident that 
when he was a baby, when he was taken to the castle of Fir'aun, Fir'aun wanted to make sure that Musa alayhi salam was not a prophet, was not the person that uh, Fir'aun uh, dreamt that his kingdom would perish at his end. So he said, I'm going to give him a date and a burning coal. If he takes a date instead of burning coal, that means that he is a prophet and he's going to kill him. If he takes the burning coal, that means just a normal baby. So Musa alayhi salam, through Allah's plan, took the coal, or rather uh, put, the, the, put his tongue on the coal, and then it burnt uh, some parts of his mouth. That's why he was lisping when he, when he spoke. And at that time, Fir'aun was appeased that Musa alayhi salam could not be a prophet. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mocked him without knowing. So the list was the result of an incident when he was presented a date and a hot coal stone and he, Musa alayhi salam, placed the coal on his tongue instead of the date. I say that most likely Musa alayhi salam, uh, because, uh, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the, the coal and put it in his mouth because the coal would, would feel too, too hot and he would throw it away. So most likely he was... Uh, crawling and you know he crawled to the coal and, and he leaned down to try to eat it uh, this is this would make more sense otherwise if he took it with his hand to put it on his tongue of course it would be too hot for him to hold it he would have thrown it away and this is our understanding Allah knows best a detailed explanation of the story is forthcoming in the following chapters that means like Surah Al-Qasas chapter 28 because the story of Musa alayhi salam is the story the most mentioned in the Quran I think it's more than 70 places if I remember correctly. However, uh, Musa alayhi salam did not ask Allah to remove this affliction, this affliction altogether. He did not ask Allah to remove the list altogether. Rather, he asked for the removal of his stammering only when he was calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that people would understand his message and what he intended from his speech. Otherwise, people wouldn't even bother listening to him. So he was only asking for what was necessary to deliver his message. If he had, if he had asked for the removal of this affliction in, enti in its entirety, it would have been cured for him. Allah subhanahu wa would have answered his dua. However, the prophets do not ask for any more than what is required. Therefore, he was left with the remnants of this accident that took place with his tongue. And when he spoke the message, the lisp and stammering went away. When he was speaking normal speech, the stammering and the uh, lisp would come back in his speech. Allah informed what Fir'aun said concerning Musa alayhi salam, mocking the fact that he couldn't uh, express himself clearly. He said, Am I not better? You know, Fir'aun, he who was the emperor, he's, he's not better than this one, Musa alayhi salam, who was despicable in his eyes, in his filthy eyes, in the filthy eyes of Fir'aun, another person, and can scarcely express himself clearly because, as we said, the lisp and the stammering. This meant that Musa is was not eloquent in his speech because people who are eloquent in speech are bound to be followed by at least a certain portion of the people, even if they are called into falsehood. But the fact that they are eloquent in speech would make some people be misled by them and follow them. Concerning Allah's statement, and appoint for me a helper for my family, Harun, my brother. This is also a request from Musa alayhi salam concerning something not pertaining to himself. That was his request for the assistance of his brother Harun. A third reported from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri from Ikrima, who said that Ibn Abbas said, Harun was made a prophet at the same moment as Musa alayhi salam. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Aisha al-Dirana went out uh, one day intended to perform Umrah and stopped to camp among some Bedouins. Of course, she wasn't traveling alone. She had some mahrams with her from her family members like uh, her nephews or other, uh, like her brother, uh, may Allah be pleased with them all. In other words, don't let someone think that she went out to perform Umrah by herself because as Prophet said, the woman should not travel by herself even for Umrah or Hajj. So she went out intending to perform Umrah and stopped to camp amongst some Bedouins. While she was among them, she heard a man say, which brother in this life was the most beneficial to his brother? The people said, we do not know. The man said, by Allah, I know. Aisha said, I said to myself about his swearing that he should not swear such an oath, singling himself out as knowing what person was the most benefit to his brother because he could be wrong. 
But then when the man said, it is Musa alayhi salam, when he asked for prophethood to be bestowed upon his brother, then Aisha then said, by Allah he has spoken truthfully, because no brother has benefited his brother like Musa alayhi salam benefited Harun, because Musa alayhi salam was the cause for Harun to become a prophet. So no brother has interceded for prophethood on behalf of his brother, except Musa alayhi salam. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commended Musa by his, say, by his saying that he was honorable before Allah. Concerning Musa's statement about his brother Harun, as he increased my strength with him, Mujahid said this means to make my back strong. Because of course, two people are feared more than one person. And let him share my task, make him my consultant in this matter. And also to... Uh, confirm my message. That we may glorify you much and remember you much. Mujahid said, a servant of Allah is not considered of those who remember Allah much until he remembers Allah while standing, while sitting, and while lying down. Concerning Allah's statement, Verily you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ever see in us. Allah is with us everywhere we are, with his knowledge, not physically, as some deviant people say, with his knowledge. Consider yourself looking down at some ants in a box. You are with them, but you are not inside the box. So Allah belongs the highest example. Allah is with us with his knowledge. He sees and hears everything that we, or even the small ant in the darkest night under the uh, darkest stone in the depths of earth, uh, what noise it makes and what it does and what it eats, let alone for us who are on this earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and hears everything that we, we do. This means in your choosing us, giving us the prophethood and sending us to your enemy, Fir'aun. So unto you is all praise for this because you are Allah who deserves all praises. This is it for today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us the beneficial knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from trials and tribulations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to understand and finish the explanation of the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a lasting sadaqah after our death. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us hasana in this world and hasana in the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from all trials and tribulations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and our children and our provisions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back all the Muslims to the true path, especially the youth among them, and to make them gather around a single leader that will lead them to establish truth and justice in this world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise our ranks in, our, in this dunya and in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the best day of our existence the day that we meet him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally to gather us, the Prophet Muhammad salam, in the highest paradise of the Firdaus. Wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan brothers.